Good morning. Good to see you. I'm excited about this message. So I was supposed to do it last week, but I didn't want to waste it on a cold. I'm feeling 100% better. I might not sound perfect, but I feel a lot better. I feel great. Last week, I felt terrible. This week, I feel great. So if you missed last week, maybe, just maybe, this message is for you. Yeah? Yeah? So maybe God, uh, po- maybe God made me sick so that you could hear this message. What do you think? Is that, is that a possibility? I'll take it. I'll get sick for you. Yeah. So I'm excited about this message. Uh, let, me, let me give you a little warning. The stories that I'm going to tell, there is a very high body count. A lot of people die. And I don't want that to... Um, Put a negative taste in your mouth. I I, I don't want you to focus on those that die. I want you to focus on those that are living. We need to learn how to live life. We need to learn how to live and not die. Some say you die once, but a lot of people die every day. We need to stop that. We need to live life and live it to the fullest. This is what Jesus has called us to do. So don't get hung up. And all the people that God killed in these stories, <laughs> I want you to focus on the ones that chose to get blessed in the midst of the hardship, in the midst of the, the desert seasons. We're talking about Moses, the biography of Moses. He is now in the midst of the desert seasons. The Israelites tend to grumble and complain, right? This is kind of seems to be their native language is complaining. But now things are worse. They, they're really, they, they made it into an art. They're really complaining and griping about everything. Have you noticed that it's obviously getting hotter these days, right? Amen. Have you noticed that people's fuses are a lot shorter these days? You know, you notice when the temperature rises, so do people's tempers. Driving around, it's just like Mad Max out there. You're like, you feel like you're living in an apocalyptic landscape. People are running you off the road, and it's just people are short and rude. You're wondering if they're gonna, you know, pull out a gun. I mean, it's just crazy when the, when the temperature gets hot. And and myself, you know, I'm complaining about the heat. My wife's complaining about the heat. Like we don't like it. It's like there's a lot to complain about. It's hot. Your electric bill goes up. You get sweaty. It's just not fun. The irony is, is that about, I don't know, two months ago, I was complaining about the rain. <laughs> Isn't that funny how that works? We can always find something to complain about. And so this is kind of what's taking place. The, the Israelites have amped up their complaining to a new level of gripe because it's hot. It's hot, it's sweaty, they've been camping for a long time, they don't want to do family camp anymore, they want to go stay at the Ritz. (laughs) They're done with this. And we see Moses in the midst of the heat. Not only is it getting hot physically, it's getting hot socially, it's getting hot with his his military rivals, like there's bad guys in the land, like things are getting hot, and the, the, the pressure, he's under a pressure cooker. And this is what, and again, a lot of people are going to die. I mean, I'm a guy, I kind of like these stories, right? A lot of people are going to die. And what we need to learn today is not how people die, but how people live. Moses chooses to live. Moses knows how to fight battles, and this is what I want you to learn today. I want you to learn how to fight battles, spiritual battles, relationship battles, work battles, battling the principalities of the air, like now more than ever, we need to learn how to fight, and Moses knows how to fight. And so we're going to be looking at, at three 
postures of battle, three postures of spiritual warfare, if you will, three things that you can specifically do today so that you will not lose, so that you will not die in the desert. You don't want to die in the desert, do you? You want to go into the promised land. So let's not die, let's live. And let's just look at what Moses does. So three stories. First story, we got Moses, the great lawgiver. He gives us the Ten Commandments. He is the deliverer of Israel. He is the worker of signs and wonders. One of the things that we always got to keep in mind is that Moses is a Christ type. He, does a, he makes a lot of mistakes. He has an emotional makeup. He's an emotional person. We see him get angry, but we also see him act a whole lot like Jesus. He's a Christ type, so always keep that in your mind. He gives us the law. Jesus gives us his word. He delivers Israel. Jesus delivers uh, his people into salvation. There's a lot of things that he does that, uh, that mimics Jesus. Even taking on criticism, persecution, negativity, complaining and griping, Moses has to deal with some of the most fierce critics the world has ever seen, Jewish people. In the heat of the desert, when Moses thinks that, you know, maybe we can just kind of get used to this camping thing for a bit, in the heat of the desert, not a whole lot going on. Not a whole lot of you know, not a, not a whole lot of drama. There's no been they haven't been split in the Red Sea lately. Everything's a little quiet, all quiet on the Western Front. Aaron, his brother, is the high priest. Moses is the political leader. Aaron, the high priest. And if you were with us a couple weeks ago, Aaron's the guy that really kind of messed up. Like, he doesn't deserve to be the high priest because, you know, he kind of fell to peer pressure, made a golden calf that everybody worshipped, and then he made an incredible excuse that it just popped out of the fire. He doesn't know how it got there. That guy is the high priest. Why? It's because God chose him. It's because God anointed him to be the high priest. And for some reason... The tribes of Reuben and the priestly tribes of Levite, well, they're criticizing Aaron and Moses' leadership. They are positioning themselves for a leadership change. They are going to, they have plans They've been talking behind closed doors. They have plans to usurp Moses and Aaron's leadership. And in Numbers uh, chapter 16, this is called the Korahite or the Rebellion of Korah. The Korahite or the Rebellion of Korah. So Korah is one of the key elders. He's one of the key leaders of the Levite tribe. So he is in the priestly tribe. He is an elder and some 250. 50, 250 other key leaders from Levite and from the tribe of Reuben. Reuben is the number one tribe. Like, if there's going to be a political leader, it should come from the tribe of Reuben. But no, we've got this Moses guy instead. And so they're grumbling, they're complaining, they're criticizing his leadership. They, they think that they can do it better. And they approach Moses, and they say, uh, it's time for you to in Aaron to step down. We are now going to take over and we're now going to take charge. And it is a full-blown coup d'etat rebellion. And Moses' head is spinning. That's pretty tough, right? That's some pretty tough criticism. To have your own people, your own tribe, the people that you have led and freed from bondage and slavery to, uh, to stab you in the back. Like, it's, it's, this, is, this is hard stuff. And this is not Moses' first rodeo. Before the Korahite Rebellion, 
Moses had to deal with the rebellion of his own family. Remember Miriam, the one that helped Moses be saved as a baby in, 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 the, in the Nile? Remember, remember that story? That's, remember the cartoon, the sweet little story of, of Miriam, how, how she guides the basket and how she orchestrates and how she takes care of Moses as a baby? Yeah, Moses' sister stabs him in the back. This is fascinating. It's a fascinating story. Uh, she and her brother Aaron come to Moses, and she says to Moses, hey, you know what? God speaks to us too, not just to you, Moses, but God speaks to us too. You think that you're all that, but God speaks to us too. And then she goes into, this is interesting, So, which is true, right? That's a true statement, amen? God speaks to me. God speaks to you. Whenever there's a criticism, there's always an element of truth in there, yeah? Moses is like, yeah, sure, Miriam, God speaks to you, for sure. And then she begins to criticize his wife. Who did Moses marry? Did Moses marry a nice Jewish girl? He didn't. He didn't marry a nice Jewish girl. He married a Midianite. He married Zipporah. We're not sure exactly what she looked like, but she wasn't Jewish. And some commentaries, scholars believe, and it, it's kind of like a no duh. Most likely, the Midianites were Bedouin. They were travelers. They were desert people. And are you ready for this? Very, very dark skinned Midianites. There might have even been some Nubian blood in there. So Moses had a type. <laughs> so Moses has a type. And interestingly enough, his sister is not okay with who he married. God seems to be just fine with it. But the implication from the scholars and the commentaries is, yeah, she's not, a part, she's not an Israelite, but furthermore, she's too dark for you. Isn't that, like we got the, one of the very first instances of racism right here in the, in the story. There's a couple of others, but this one's like, it's kind of hidden, it's kind of, you know, suggested. But uh, that's what's being implied. She's like, hey Moses, God speaks to us too, and by the way, we don't like your wife. She's too dark for our family. Woo! Are you guys okay? Yeah, that's what's going on. And so Miriam is instructed to stick her hand under the coat and... And then she pulls it out, and her hand is like ghostly white with leprosy. And basically, God is saying, oh, so you like, skin, you, you like the light skin? How about this? How does that feel for you? You think the lighter skin, the fairer skin's better? Well, now you, get, you got a white hand. How does that feel, Miriam? Is that, that's God's way of saying, yeah, this, this, this is, color is not anything. I'll, if, if it's really important to you, I'll make you really creepy looking. You want to continue? Would you like to continue with this, with this logic? All right, who's the whitest person in the church? Not me. Let's start looking around. Who's the whitest person? I got a little. <laughs> this time, sorry. I got one percent African, so I'm okay. Maybe I can get one percent of those reparations. I would take it. That would go a long way. Okay, I should stop, right? Oh, come on, it's funny. No, it's not funny. Okay, anyway. Okay, so you see, we have we have. The rebellion of Korah, we've got the rebellion of Miriam. Like, this is, this, is, this is really hurtful, heavy stuff that Moses is dealing with. And this is, how, this is how he responds. He says, Miriam, you can't tell me what to do, woman. No woman can tell me what to do. I'm the man. You get back into your place, Miriam. That's when he does that. And then to Korah, he responds to Korah. Um, I can kind of relate to this. I, we named our dog Cora. And so I deal with the rebellion of Cora almost every day. <laughs> so in the midst of the rebellion of Cora, Mos Moses turns to Cora after they're trying, like it's a, again, it's a full-blown coup d'etat. They're going to remove Moses and Aaron from leadership. And, and Moses' response was, Cora. Don't make me angry. You see, whenever anger and rage 
grows inside of Moses. A metamorphosis takes place. And he begins to turn green. And a righteous indignation begins to burn. And so he turns to Korah and he says, Korah, you don't make me angry. Don't make me angry. You're not, you're not going to like me when I'm angry. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Did anybody else get that that was the whole quote? Aren't you proud of me? And he's like, I'm angry. You can't challenge my authority. And he just, he loses his stuff. He's like, ah, and he's like, he's, let me see me rip my shirt off. You wouldn't see the Hulk. You would most likely see like the wolf man or <laughs> you, <laughs> like a, a little, uh, a little Sasquatch, a little, uh, <laughs> a little, a little yeah, Chaka or a, uh, you know, a little Bigfoot. And so you know, my wife's doing this thing on blurry creatures and Bigfoot and aliens and stuff. It's great. You should go. But so if you ever see a blurry creature around the church, it's just me with my shirt off. <laughs> He's just, I mean, think about Moses. Like, think about Think about when the righteous indignation boiled up inside him and think about what he did to the Ten Commandments. He's like, Moses, smash! Moses, smash Ten Commandments! Moses, smash you now! And he's just going to destroy them all. Right? He's got the power. He's got the power from God. He's just going to kill them all. They can't stand up against Moses. Okay, now, this is Moses battling. But the truth is, I just made all that stuff up. It's not in the Bible. Moses' response is nothing like that. Moses is not the Bruce Banner of the Bible. Right? Moses is, he doesn't, he's not, some cases, he is controlled by his emotions. We see that. Sometimes anger does get the better of him. But in the case of Miriam and in the case of Korah, he is he, he tells his emotions what to do. He's not controlled and dictated by his emotions. He doesn't turn into a holy hulk. He doesn't lose his stuff. He doesn't lose his temper. He actually does the exact opposite. Moses, in Numbers 12, says that Moses is the meekest man that ever walked the earth until Jesus comes. So Jesus is the meekest man. But before Jesus, it's Moses. Moses is number two. That's why he's so great, because he's the meekest man that ever walked. It is not part divine. Psalms 147 says, The Lord lifted up the meek, and he cast the wicked down to the ground. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek. God, if you're meek, God's going to make you beautiful. He will beautify the meek with salvation. And then, of course, Matthew 5.5. 5. You're familiar with this. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, Jesus says, Blessed are the meek. Why? Because they shall what? Inherit the earth. The definition of meekness is power under control. That's Moses' response. God's response is, uh, is, is a little different. Back to the Korahite rebellion. Why is this such a big deal? Well, Korah and the elders and the chieftains, the leaders of these tribes, some 250 of them, and people of religious bent, they don't think that they need a high priest. They think that they can do religion on their own terms. And so when they come to him, when they come to Moses and they say, we want to we take over the show, Moses does not turn into a hulking green hulk. He does not, he does not uh, get angry. Actually, he is angry. He does tell them, you guys have gone too far. Uh, Korah actually um, comes to Moses. And again, there's always truth in criticism, right? 
There's always truth in criticism. Whenever somebody says, I want to speak the truth in love to you, you just wait for the backhanded uh, slap there. There's, there, there, there's, there's, something, there's something else coming. Okay, well, let me hear the truth. So Korah comes to Moses presenting the truth. The truth is, we all are a nation of priests. True statement. He says, Israel, God has designed Israel to be a nation of priests. And we believe this in the church. We believe in the priesthood of every believer. Meaning that if you are a husband of a house, you are the priest. You are, you are the priest of that house. So this is a true statement. And so this is what Korah is presenting. We know we're all priests. And well, Aaron, it's our turn. But they forgot about the concept of the high priest. And so Moses' response, you're not, no one's going to like this, but this is what's true, and this is how Moses fights. Moses' response is, okay, I want to try and talk you out of this. It's not going to go well for you. You have gone too far. Korah just told Moses that Moses has gone too far. Now Moses is telling Korah, you have gone too far, and it will not go well for you. So I'm encouraging you to back it up. And they keep pushing. And then he says, okay. And then we see the position of battle. And the first position, you actually have notes today, so write this down. The first position is the position of submission. So instead of, instead of Moses hulking out, he submits. He literally prostrates himself down on the ground. And we're not sure exactly what he's praying, but guarantee you he is interceding for them. He is interceding for the situation. He has every legal right to squelch this coup d'etat, this rebellion. He, has every, he, he can do it. In fact, he could destroy this rebellion instantly, within a second. Why? It's because he's got Joshua and Caleb on his side. The biggest badasses in the Bible. They can take care of those 250 in their own right. They were willing to fight the Nephilim giants. See, uh, make us blurry study creature. They weren't afraid of anything. Everybody else is a bunch of wimps. Like, Moses could have just looked at Joshua and Caleb and said, oh, we're going to get some blood on our hands. Let's just kill these guys off and we'll start all over. But no, Moses doesn't do that. He gets down and he prostrates and he submits to the Lord. Oh, yeah. No one wants to do that. Specifically, when somebody is stabbing you in the back. Now, this is, a, this is the biography of Moses. We're here to learn what Moses does to be victorious. This is, um, you know, this is not the, this is not the lessons of rebellious, of the rebellious ruined, right? Like, you don't want to learn lessons from people that are rebellious. You want to learn lessons from people that are victorious. And so this is how Moses responds to backstabbing betrayers. He, he submits the situation to the Lord. Isn't that rough? I don't want to do that. I want my pound of flesh. If somebody comes up against me, we're going to fight. But Moses does not fight. He submits them to the Lord. He submits himself, right, okay. There's three things. Maybe you can write this in the side notes. He submits himself to the Lord first, right? That's what good leaders do. He's submitting himself to the Lord. He submits the situation to the Lord because this is a coup d'etat. Like he can win it, but regardless, he's going to submit the very situation to the Lord. And then finally, he submits the people to the Lord. And he says, okay, here are the censors. If you priests want to go and try... We'll let the Lord decide, <laughs> okay? So what, what, what Moses is doing, he's saying, okay, here is the holy objects, these like uh, metal censer things, you know, if you're Catholic, you know what they are. You know, they got, you put incense in them and you swing them around. And so the, these Levites dress up as priests. They're like, you know, 
Hebrew reenactors. So they put on all the clothes and they pretend to be holy and they get the censers and they begin to do these ritual practices and they're spinning their, their censers around and they're smoking up the place. They're getting all super holy. They're putting on a show. But they're doing it themselves and without the high priest. We all have to have a high priest. They didn't have a high priest. They said we can achieve salvation with our own abilities. That's a scary thing to do. And while Moses is prostrating himself and submitting to the Lord, I told you there's going to be a high body count here. The literal earth opens up, and all Korah and all of his family, all of his dissenters, they fall into that gap. They fall to the death. But number 16 says, and they didn't just fall to the death. They fell into the pit of Sheol. They went to hell. Woo! You guys okay? When your people come against you, when your family comes against you, when you have a Miriam, Moses responds the same way to Miriam. He just, he's quiet. He doesn't lose his temper. He has his emotions under control. He's quiet in a prayerful position, and he lets it go. Amen? When people come against you, in the name of the Lord, some of us have been fighting battles with friends and neighbors, church people, family members. You're always looking for the next jab. You're always looking for the next angle. You're always looking to be justified and rectified and all of those things. You're fighting. You're fighting. You're fighting. You're fighting your own battles. But the truth of the Word of God is, is that you need to allow the Lord to fight your own battles. You submit them into the situation. You submit it to the Lord. Job 22:21 says, Submit. Who likes this word submit? Mako loves it. But who likes this word submit? <laughs> who likes this word submit? Americans don't like this word submit. We don't submit to no one, right? But the Bible, the Word of God says, submit to God. Be at peace with Him. Are you at peace with God? Are you raging against Him? Are you complaining? Are you griping? Are you you wanting better food. Be at peace with him. In this way, ready, prosperity will come to you. I don't know. I want to be prosperous. I want to, I want to, I want to win. The position to win those battles is a submitting position to the Lord. Exodus 14, 14. The Lord will fight for you. You just only have to be silent. The Lord will fight for you. We need to let God fight for you. So in other words, shut up, quit talking so much, and let God fight your battles for you. Yeah? Second Chronicles 20.17, you will not need to fight this battle. Right? You don't have to fight. But you do have to stand firm. Hold your position. What's your position? Your position is submission. Hold your position and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah, O Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. Is the Lord with you in your battles? Deuteronomy 20. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies, to give you the victory. Deuteronomy 1. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt, in that land of slavery. He's still fighting for you. He's fighting for you back then. He's fighting for you now. And then in the New Testament, same idea, the same truth, the same biblical truth comes through. Romans 12, 19. Beloved, 
Do not avenge yourselves. Are you guys okay? Uh, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, you know this, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and I will repay. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heat burning coals on top of his head. It's going to do something. It's going to have a spiritual impact. There's going to be a change in that person. They're going to, they're going to feel the, the uncomfortability of the conviction of the Holy Spirit if you submit them to the Lord, if you allow God to, to have vengeance. And do not overcome evil, but overcome evil with what? Good. This is uh, the Passion Translation, same verse, Passion Translation, or the Passion Paraphrase. Like, don't Google that online because everybody's saying it's heretical. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But this sounds really good. It's, it's the same thing. It's just a different interpretation of it. Listen. Beloved, don't be obsessed with taking revenge. Right? All right what are you obsessed with? Sometimes we get stuck inside of our own heads and we're so obsessed about being right. We're so obsessed about getting the upper hand. We're so obsessed about that situation, right? We're obsessed about winning, taking that person down. If you're constantly obsessed with getting your way, if you're constantly obsessed with a past situation that still holds power over you, you need to submit that situation to the Lord. Quit being obsessed about negative things and negative people. But leave that to God's righteous justice. I would rather leave it to my own righteous justice. God, thank you very much. No, you leave it to God's righteous justice, not yours. Your justice stinks. Your righteousness is filthy rags. For the scriptures say, vengeance is mine and I will repay, says the Lord. And if your enemy is hungry, you buy him lunch. Like, who wrote this? Who wrote this? I don't want to do that. I don't want to be nice to people I don't like. Win him over with kindness for your surprising generosity will awaken his conscience. Isn't that interesting? You want to win the fight? Win him over with kindness. It's an upside down kingdom we're talking about here. In order to win, you have to submit. In order to go high, you've got to go low. And God will reward you with favor. Never let evil defeat you, but defeat evil with good. Moses does not get emotional in these situations. Moses gets submissive. He submits himself, he submits the situation, and he submits people to the Lord. Maybe that's one thing you can do today if you're dealing with interpersonal struggles. Submit it to the Lord. Quit ruminating on it. Quit obsessing about it. Surrender it over and just see what God can do when he fights your battles for you. Second posture. So the first posture is going low. It is bowing your head. It is submitting. The second posture of battle, write this down, is almost completely opposite. That is lifting your head up high. It is getting your, your head up out of the muck and the mire. You need to be looking up in addition to looking down in the, in the posture of prayer. You also need to be looking up in the posture of praise. You need to be looking up at Jesus himself. For the sake of time, I'll paraphrase the story. But Moses, Moses sins. I don't have time to get into Moses' sin, but he strikes the rock a couple times and, you know, he wasn't supposed to do it. He loses his stuff. But then we see another situation close to this one where... You know what? I am going to read it because it's, yeah, I got to read this. This is too good. I hope I got it. That's Moses writing. Okay, that's not it. I think it's in Exodus. Hmm. 
No, that's not it. Wait, I know what it is. It's, it's number 16, I believe. No, it's not. Never mind. I'll have to tell the story. Okay, so Moses is in the desert. No, I've got to read it. I mean, let me find it because it's too good. It's the bronze serpent. What's the bronze serpent passage? Help me out, folks. Numbers 21. Thank you very much. Who got it? Oh, of course, the Eagle Scout. Yeah, and it is right here. I had, I had my bookmark on it. And I was just looking at the wrong page. I was right there. Okay, here we go. Ready? You hear some, grid, some griping and complaining that you've never heard before. It's amazing. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient because it's super freaking hot. Okay? The people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God, and they spoke against Moses. That's not a good combination, as you, as you learn. And they said... Why have you brought us up out of Egypt, out of slavery, to die in the desert? There is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. You want to know what that miserable food is? It's like literal magic bread from heaven. Like We detest your miracles. We detest your provision. We detest what you've given us. We want more than the Lord sent Venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many of the Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We've sinned. No, duh. Right? They figured that one out. We have sinned when we spoke and said we, uh, against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. Because the people are used to Moses interceding and praying for them and getting them out of hot water. Pray that the Lord will take these snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then, so he's activating something in God's heart. And the Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it on a pole. If anyone who is bitten can look at it, it, they will live. And so Moses made a bronze snake and he put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Very strange little story here, right? Lots of people are dying from natural causes. They're getting bit in the context of nature. They're getting bit by venomous vipers. Why? Because, well, they were complaining too much. Because they were, they were so focused, they were so obsessed with their complaints that they couldn't see where God wanted to lead them. This is a very strange story because a couple of weeks ago when we were doing the Ten Commandments, we learned that we're not supposed to make images or idols. No carbon image can you worship. And so what in the world's going on here? Because God tells them to make a bronze snake and put it up on a pole, and they are to look at it. They are to look up there. Anybody ever see uh, the Three Amigos? Look up here. Look up here. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> they're, to, they're, to, they're to look at this bronze blazing snake because there's all of these snakes going around. What in the world's going on? I thought we weren't supposed to worship idols. They're not worshiping. It is... It's a symbol to say, hey, you need to get your eyes off of these snakes and you need to get your eyes on Jesus. Jesus is going to reference this very scripture. He says, as Moses lifted up this, the bronze snake in the desert, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. We need to keep our eyes upon Jesus. Now, <clears throat> if, you are if you're battling, if you're battling sickness, if you're battling anxiety, if you're battling fear, if you're battling the the, the the constraints of the environment. 
the natural environment and the man-made environment. I'm really concerned about what we are doing to not just our natural environment. I'm worried about the very water I drink these days. I think it's making me into a woman. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. But if I am constantly obsessed about all these little snakes that are running around, if I'm constantly obsessed about what could bite me next, what could possibly be hiding in that bush, what is under that basket, if I'm constantly obsessed about these things, well, that's what I'm going to give power to. That's what I give power to. And it's understandable, right? These people are like, oh my gosh, there's snakes everywhere. And where are they looking? They're looking down because, because there's snakes everywhere. What do the snakes represent? The snakes represent their own sin. Isn't that, that's what's going on. Did you guys catch that? Because, you know, we know that snakes are bad, right? They're creepy, they're slimy, and the devil is the great serpent, and, you know, Mary's going to crush his head, and he, he's going to bite her heel. But we know, we know that the snakes represent the, Satan. They represent evil. They represent sin in these biblical contexts. And so if you're constantly looking around, all around you, everything that is slithering, everything that's hiding in a bush, everything that's underneath the basket, just ready to get you, if you're constantly focused on your sin, what do you think is going to bite you? Sin. And you're going to constantly be in a state of anxiety. You're going to constantly be getting sick over and over again. You're going to constantly be hurting each other. The venom is going to get in you. And so what's the antidote? The antidote is to lift up that sin and nail it to the cross. So that's, what, that's what's going on. And Moses is saying, you need to look up here. You need to look up at this fake snake, this symbol of your sin that is nailed on the cross. This is a Christ type. But someday, and that day was 2,000 years ago, when Jesus took your sin, your snakes, and he nailed them to the cross forever to be dead. Amen. So let's just, get, let's just look up here. Get your, get your eyes up on Jesus. Turn your gaze to heavenly places instead of focusing on your sin, on what's going to tear you down. What you focus on, what you resist, is going to continue to persist. Oh, i got to quit. i got to quit drinking this drink. 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 Where's the drink? The drink's down here. i got to quit drinking this drink. What are you going to do? You're going to drink the drink. But if your eye is looking up on heaven, you're going to forget about the sin. You're going to forget about the drink. So quit giving power to snakes in your life. Hebrews 12, 1 through 4 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, those are our brothers and sisters in Christ, your family members, saints, Paul and the apostles, they are all up in heavenly places, the cloud of witnesses rooting you on, making sure that you, you're successful. Isn't that encouraging? God's rooting you on, and so are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Grandma's up there cheering you on right now. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, the sin that so easily bites our heels. And let us run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us. What? Fixing our eyes on Jesus. You want to run a good race? You want to fight a good battle? You've got to fix your eyes on Jesus. The pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. You can't make your faith perfect. Only Jesus can For the joy set before him, he endured that cross, the scorn, its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God and considered him to endure such opposition for sinners so that we will not grow weary and that we will not lose heart. So don't grow weary. Don't don't lose heart. Don't fall into anxiety. Don't fall into patterns of sin. Don't fall into patterns of sickness. Keep your eye, keep your focus on Jesus. All right, and then Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is. Quit looking at snakes. Set your heart on things above where Christ is. So that your minds, set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. 
That is such a difficult thing to do, isn't it? Because we're just consumed with everything that is going on in the earthly realm. I want to encourage you to take some time and think about things in heavenly realms. And then the final position that Moses takes. Again, first one, he's down. Second one, he's up. The third position that Moses takes to win battles is an unusual one. And again, it's one that's not going to come natural to you. I mean, unless you're a team player. Some of us aren't team players. Second, the third and final position is that position of community. You need to be positioned in the midst of community if you want to win battles. You cannot, it is impossible to win battles, to win spiritual battles, to be successful in that long run, in that long haul, by yourself. You cannot achieve it by yourself. In the same way, the, the priests of Korah, when they're swinging their things, they're trying to achieve it within their own abilities. Oh yeah, and by the way, the fire of God came down and smoked all those guys, and they had to sift through their ashes to pull out the, the, the incense burners. That's, that's kind of cool. Um, in the same way, you, you, cannot, you, you cannot live a holy life out of the context of community. Moses understood this. Moses got this. If anybody had the right to, to say to himself, I'm going to live my own spiritual life upon my terms. I'm going to find God. I'm going to connect with him in the, in, the, in, the, in the presence of nature. I'm just going to sit under a tree and do God my own way because I don't like people and I don't trust people. I'd rather hang out with my dog than hang out with people. Can I get an amen? I understand. I feel you. I feel you. And yet, we can't, we, we're not allowed to do that. Why? Because we are the body of Christ, and we all have a part to play. There are moments in your life where, where you will be weak, where you will be spiritually depleted, and you're going to need your brothers and sisters to lift you up, to encourage you, to raise up your hands. There will be moments in my life where I'm going to be spiritually depleted, and you're going to need to hold up my hand so that we can continue to grow the church. And this is what takes place. This is what Moses does. He, he, allows, he allows his knuckleheaded brother to hold up his arms. I don't even know who this whore guy is. Like, he's some stranger. We don't know what he does. Maybe he was a good Bible study teacher. Who knows? But he allows him to hold up his hands. This Again, this is after the sin of Moses. This is after Moses blew it. This is after Moses knows that he's not allowed to go into the promised land. He's got to stay in the desert. He's got to die in the desert with all these other complainers because there was that one a couple of times where he did allow his emotions to get the better of him. His emotions told him what to do. He did not tell his emotions what to do. Because of that sin, he wasn't allowed to go in. But even after that failure, God still used him. All right, how many people have failed? How many people have blown it? It's just John in this room. He's the, only, he's the only one. He's the only one. Everybody else here is perfect. Good for you guys. But as for me and John, we've blown it. We have disqualified ourselves. And yet, God can and still use you to win battles. He ha it is the Lord's heart to restore and to lift up. After this huge failure, right after this huge failure, they are facing the Amalekites in one of their very first battles, like a legitimate battle. They're not necessarily trained for this. The Amalekites are, they're, they're horrible. I can't wait to talk, well, we're done, this is the last season, so that's the last sermon on this series, so I can't talk more about the Amalekites. But they're like the worst. They are so evil. They're so corrupted. They do things that would make Hollywood blush. And so they're in the way, and they, they attack God's people. Like, this is warfare. This is literal warfare. It's spiritual warfare, but it's a, there's, there's swords and javelins and spears and shields involved. 
And God's people need to win. And so Joshua takes command of the army. They begin to fight the Malachites. They bring Moses up on top of the hill. And it starts early in the morning. And Moses is praying and he is blessing the people and he's holding his hands out like this and he's doing it all day long. Moses is 80 years old. He's, a, he's an old guy at this time and he's, work, he's still working. He's working hard. He's got his hands up. But when the sun begins to set, he begins to get tired and he needs the context of community to hold up his hands. Whenever his hands went down, the Amalekites started to win. Whenever he was not able to, to, to push himself and the people into the spirit of worship, then the bad guys win. Did you guys catch that? When we're not able to worship, the bad guys win. We have to have our hands raised high. This is why the Bible says, uh, men, lift up holy hands. Whenever our hands are lifted high in the atmosphere and the position of praise, we win. Whenever they're down, we begin to lose. This is why the rhythm of worship and the rhythm of Sabbath is so vital for your victory. You have to do this every Sunday. You have to worship every Sunday. You have to prostrate every Sunday. You have to look up every Sunday. You have to raise your hands every Sunday. And when you get tired and when your hands get low, you need to have people around you that will hold up your hands. That is the position of community. So is those three positions. Do you have people around you that will hold up your hands when you're tired? Do you have the fortitude to stand firm and not lose your temper when people come against you? Do you have the vision? The vision, that spiritual discipline to have vision, to look up when you want to look down. That's the message. Which one is for you today? There's three points there. Pick one. Focus on one today. You're going to forget about this message by tomorrow. But we want, to we want to encourage you to live a prosperous, victorious life. This is how we fight our battles. This is how we win wars. Let's submit to God. Let's look up. And let's be in the context of community. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's get the band and come, come to the front. Let's uh, grab our manna. Let's grab our bread from heaven. Oh, incidentally, by the way, that bronze serpent that they lifted up, that symbol of the crucifixion, that symbol of hell, like it's everywhere. You can see it on ambulances and you can see it on, hotel, or on hospitals and such. That, that snake on top of the pole, it's the sign of health and healing. It's everywhere. Just from this one instance. It's a powerful symbol for your healing. But you know that King Hezekiah had to destroy that bronze serpent? Do you know why? It's because they made it, they made it an idol. God's people began to worship this object instead of worshiping God. So don't worship objects. Don't worship statues. Don't fall prey to materialism. You, know, you have a personal relationship with the divine God. He is unseen. If you need a little symbolism to push you into relationship we're okay with that but don't allow the symbolism to become religious kings will burn that this is the bread from heaven this is the body of christ this symbolizes this is a symbol but it is also very relational it symbolizes your provision god has given you everything that you need right now it might not feel like it. You might be saying, where's my bread? Where's my water? We're tired of this icky food. Let's never hold this in contempt. This is the body of Christ for our provision. Stay connected to the body of Christ. Stay connected in that context, in that position of community. And you'll be victorious. Receive the victory of Jesus Christ into your body now. You got snakes all around you, crawling on you, around your feet, plagued by sin and death. 
Let's just wash that away right now with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. This is the blood of Jesus Christ. This symbolizes everything that washes us clean. Everything that has been nailed on that cross, all of our snakes that have been nailed on that cross, it washes them away so they don't exist anymore. In this moment, maybe you sinned uh, this week because it got too hot. You cut somebody off and said some bad words. Let's just take care of that right now. Let's just wash away the sin with the blood of Jesus. Receive this cup, the new covenant for the forgiveness of your sins. Thank you, Jesus. May I invite the ushers to come to the front as we're going to return to the Lord. He is faithful. He has never left you. He's never forsaken you. I want to encourage you to put that mark of God upon your finances so that you will be victorious, so that you'll win battles. It is a sacrifice, I know. But we have We have a high priest. I'm not the high priest. Jesus is the high priest. And we need him to make sacrifices for us. This is returning to the Lord is just that gesture. It says, we're sacrificing to you so that you can sacrifice to us and then intercede for us in the presence of God. God bless you as you give back to the Lord. Let's pray. I sing praises to Praises to your name. Them so much higher than all names. All honor to your name. pray with me before I send you off with the blessing. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just come right now and that you will rest on us in our midst. May we take the peace of God with us out of this room and into our homes and into our work environments and our school settings. We ask for a divine protection, a divine protection that leads us and guides us into the areas where you are working and where you're manifesting. We ask that we take the good news, the gospel message out into the world, that we go ye into all the world proclaiming the good news. Pray that you give us that heart and that mindset. Prior to that, Lord, for everyone here, 
I pray right now that you will just highlight into their minds whom and what situations that they need to give to you, what they need to submit to you, what hard past trauma they need to submit to you, what hard, bitter feelings they have towards others that they need to submit to you so they can be free from those bondages, they can be free from those chains. We submit to you, Lord, wholeheartedly. We hand these situations over to you, that you may take care of them in your will, your timing, and your power. And if there's work that needs to be done on us, we pray that we would be open to the leading and the correction of the Holy Spirit so that we too can submit to change and transformation. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he turn towards you in your desert seasons. May he fill your home with peace, with love, with provision. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. May we go in all victory. May we win battles today. Amen. Amen.